Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Chappie, and it's time to get even more metaphysical because we're gonna be going over the big second half of the planar realms. I'm gonna go over each and every outer plane, give a brief description of what to expect, and warn you of any side effects that may occur from planar travel lasting more than four hours. As always, keep in mind that a lot of this is just my opinion, so if you wanna be your own space cop, feel free to run your multiverse however you like. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So starting with the astral plane, so much like how the ethereal plane is the sloppy space soup of the inner worlds, the astral plane is the spongy sea of spectral space that swishes you through the space stream and into whatever plane you want. Also like the ethereal plane, the astral plane has a natural hazard in the form of psychic winds, which are like the good old ether cyclones, but so much worse. These things won't just throw you in every which way, but they will psychically hurt you, they'll drive you insane, they'll knock you out, pretty much all the terrible things that could happen to you in an angsty twister. And then it's still likely to spit you out into a random outer plane. Much like Denny's, no one sets out to go to the astral realm, you just sort of find yourself there and go with the flow. But depending on where you are and where you want to be, the astral sea isn't your only option when it comes to visiting the various other bubbles of the cosmos. Similar to how it's technically technically possible to cross between the elemental planes once you're on them, the good aligned planes and the bad aligned planes have a common thread sewing them all together. For the good planes, it's the stairway to heaven known as the infinite staircase, and for the bad zones, it's the highway to hell called the river Styx. Traveling up the infinite staircase is as easy as walking up a flight of stairs. Literally, it could present itself as any type of stairs, like at all. And the river Styx, while more straightforward, is much more dangerous, as anyone who so much as touches the water comes down with a bad case of stupiditis. So the only way to get around it is via ferryman that'll take you where you need to go, for a price. But now that we've gone through the intermediary points between the planes, it's time to hit the outer planes proper, starting with Mount Celestia. As the name suggests, the main feature of the seven heavens of Mount Celestia is the big Chungus Mountain in the middle of the plane, surrounded by the shining silver sea. This world represents lawful good in its purest form, standing as a bastion of goodwill and fortune for those who gaze upon its lands. Natural good guys even get a permanent bless spell applied to them as long as they're there, and when they sleep, they get lesserly restored. Bad guys get nothing. Crime doesn't pay. Split between the plane and forest lie the twin paradises of Bytopia, both sides representing goodness, and both being so-so with the idea of lawfulness. Those who enter feel the power of peace and goodwill towards their fellow man, and all feelings of satisfaction after finishing a bout of work stem from Bytopia. Wow, I have been tapping into this plane for, like, a year. Up next, we have Elysium, the silent side lost lullaby, exemplar of the crushing power of good and happiness, and a good pit stop for planar travelers who think, hey, you guys want to go somewhere that isn't an absolute horror? In fact, Elysium is so much of a non-absolute horror that it puts a magical effect on anybody who enters it, influencing them to stay and effectively causing all mortals inside to willingly trap themselves inside the paradise, because of course the ultimate personification of good has to be terrifying in all the right ways. The next plane finds itself as a paradise for hunters and rangers of all kinds, which means that it's the lamest one of them all. The beast lands are filled with forests, jungles, grasslands, and all other perfect hunting areas, to the point where animal handling, perception, and survival checks are much easier to pull off on this plane. But beware, for the beast lands expect a replacement for those creatures taken from its lands, and anyone who slays a beast in this world would do well to ensure that they do not become beasts themselves. Onwards, we have the Olympian Glades of Arborea, a world full of unchecked emotion, both in the stylization of its architecture and in the inhabitants that call it home. Being the land of ultimate chaotic good, people who live in Arborea flicker between extreme, almost detrimental emotions, but never losing the drive to stand against evil, not unlike the Fae of the Feywilds. In fact, Arborea is, perhaps not coincidentally, filled with elves and elven gods, although the elves of this world are connected much more to Coralon and so carry his wild streak much heavier than other elves. One last thing to mention is that no matter their opinion on it during the Day, all those who leave Arborea feel an intense yearning to return to the lands, as if called to stand against some force that could strike at any moment. And speaking of striking at any moment, the heroic domains of Yisgard is an absolute paradise for any being that finds joy in smashing heads in and fighting until they've died. For Yisgard is special in that those who are defeated on Yisgard's mighty fields of battle are revived at dawn of the next day, fit as a fiddle and ready to stab that fiddle into the next guy. Technically, Yisgard is a good plane, but it is, unfortunately, the last that we will see of the good worlds for a while as the next plane that we have to visit is Limbo! Limbo isn't so much a land as it is a whirling vortex of concept and stray thoughts. Being chaos personified, you could spend five seconds here and see ice melt into steel, freeze into corn, and burn into a tree before flying off to migrate with the other loaves of pita bread. The benefit to Limbo is that those with a high enough intelligence to grasp the concept literally get to grasp the concept, giving them the force necessary to move and reshape objects to their own choosing. Given that Limbo is neither good nor evil, you won't find the normal creatures found in those planes here. Instead, Limbo plays host to the chaotic and wicked Slotty, a species of amphibious frog people whose inscrutable nature is as of the plane itself. Personally, Limbo's a little bit too kooky for me, but at least it's better than the next place, which is PANDEMONIUM! Where Limbo is a rioting whirlwind of nonsense and pants, Pandemonium is also a rioting whirlwind of nonsense and pants, but now the pants scream at you. Such are the winds of Pandemonium that they blow out all light sources, and trying to hear literally anything is like trying to watch a movie with your one friend that talks too much, you know the one. What's worse is that getting caught in the winds will exhaust you very quickly, eventually ending 
ending with you gaining a crippling form of dire madness, which is like regular madness, only more dire. But no world could be both as evil or as chaotic as the infinite layers of the abyss, which earns its name by throwing visitors into literally any type of horror that could possibly be imagined. Famous tourist destinations include the Gaping Maw, where Demogorgon lives, Thanatos, where Orcus lives, the Demon Web, where Loth lives, and just so, so many more. Pretty much all of the super evil bad guys live here, so winding up here is one of the worst situations you could find yourself in. Especially since, the longer you spend in the abyss, the more of a chance you have at being corrupted by it, turning you into an evil creature so that you may better fit the lands that you walk on. Of course, that doesn't really hold a candle to my favorite plane of the bunch, the Tartarian Depths of Karsiri! Who boy, do I love sending people to Karsiri. So think of Karsiri as a six-layered matryoshka doll in the form of a supermax prison run by demons, and that is Karsiri. All those who enter Karsiri will come down with an acute case of not being able to leave, no matter what magics they employ to aid in their escape. Hell, with the exception of certain heavily guarded and heavily secretive exits, the only way out is through the power of the ultimate spell itself. Wish. Now, if you just want evil in its most undiluted form, free from the murkiness of law or chaos, then you seek the Grey Waste of Hades. Devoid of emotion, those souls that have been claimed by neither god nor fiend eventually find their way to Hades, their very essence morphed into little more than a larva, destined to spend its eternity in a sunless, joyless wasteland. Any who enter Hades will notice the sheer amount of bugs that watch them with intent, and even visitors will have to maintain their focus so as not to become one more lost larva to to add to the pile. Moving on to the first connection between lawful and evil, the bleak eternity of Gehenna, the four-layered birthplace of the Yugoloths, is a place that seems created to make things harder for you. The ground stays at an annoying 45 degree angle, 100% of the time, just to end at a canyon too large to get past, and where other realms seek to torture you in ways that you once thought unimaginable, Gehenna is... <sighs> It's just mean. Even spells meant to help others, like protections and heals, have a harder time functioning because Gehenna is just the biggest dickbag world possible. Although, a close second would have to be the Nine Hells of Bator, each layer ruled by a different archdevil that all answer to Asmodeus, Lord of Layer Number 9. I'll get more in depth about these lands when I cover Devils and Demons, but for now, just know that Asmodeus has decreed that planar travel cannot extend into any layer lower than the first. So if you want to get to the bottom, you gotta start at the top. And since every layer is even worse than the last, you'd better think really long and hard about what it is you're willing to dive into hell for. Now, moving back up and away from the pure evil of the other dark domains, the infinite battlefield of Acheron is only mostly evil, instead focusing much more on being a morbid reflection of Yggsgard, with four cubic battlefields constantly careening and crashing into each other, armies on all sides colliding just as often in an eternal, deadly dance of death. Visitors to the plane will find themselves rewarded for giving into their carnal nature, with every kill blessing the killer with increased vitality so that they may continue killing forever. Secret life hack, if you're ever in a battle and need a quick army, just open a portal to Acheron and let the armies flood right out. They don't care who they kill. But moving on to the penultimate plane of never-ending law and order, the clockwork nirvana of Mechanicus shows you exactly what it's like to follow a strict, rigid rule set with absolutely no variables to speak of. The world is filled with steampunk machine creatures called Modrons that look like brass geometry lessons with arms and legs built by the ultimate god of order known as Primus. Players who spend time on Mechanicus realize that even they are susceptible to its unrelenting order, as in a fit of sheer meta power, any and all damage rolls made on Mechanus automatically default to their median roll. So a 1d10 is always 5, 1d4 is always 2, 1d8 is always 4, and so on. Mechanicus is one of the more uncomfortable planes to go to, as the world doesn't care at all about good and evil. All it cares about is maintaining order by all means necessary. And finally, making our way back to the good planes for just one last time, the peaceable kingdoms of Arcadia strive to be the most perfectionist form of good possible, with every cobble, creek, city, and castle built up meticulously with not a single stone out of place. Day and night switch at a perfect pace, weather shifts in such precise ways that even my local news anchor will be right some of the time, and much like how Arborea is home to celestial elves, Arcadia is the home to celestial dwarves! And these dwarves aren't even grumpy, they're just brave, kind-hearted, and they'll even let you toss them once in a while. Truly, this is the perfect representation of good, so much so that visitors find themselves unable to feel fear, disease, and poison because Arcadia just says no to all that silliness. Woo! I finally got through all the planes! There really was a lot to go off of, and the outer planes don't even even cover at all. Besides the Ring of Good and Evil, the final outer plane is called the Outlands, and it represents neutrality, with its main territory, Sigil, acting as a sort of intermediary between all the planes, with portals opening up to all the other worlds and converging into a city that directly combines all the outer worlds into one metropolitan world. And even beyond all that, past the outer planes, past the Astral Sea, past Sigil, lies the infinite expanse of the Far Realm, which contains... 
I mean, like, who even knows? It's uncharted land where literally anything could exist, from another plane to Cthulhu monsters to hell. Maybe you'll travel so far down the Far Realm that you'll end up in a different cosmology altogether. The adventure is yours. The metaphorical sky's the limit. Just remember to take pictures and bring back souvenirs. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like and comment if you did. Subscribe if you want to be a cool dude, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can slowly make my entire life revolve around D&D. Also, if you want to stay up to date on all of your Davi news, I keep a link to my social media in the description below. But yeah, Davi out.